Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Thanks for being here for yet another forging adventure where we make something sharp, useful, and even slightly historic. So as the title suggests, the project today is a Viking sax. And as you can see, we're using some antique, well I guess they're all antique, if you get a piece of wrought iron um, get a wrought iron anchor chain piece. It's going to be antique. And uh, my first task is to straighten this so that we can uh, turn it into a bar that we can use in our project here. Now I ended up with a couple of pieces from the welded side of the anchor chain. And um, that means it's it's been forge welded together. And it's about to come apart on me here, as you'll see in a minute, just trying to get this straightened out here. And there it goes. So I, I was kind of wondering, I wonder how good of a weld that was, or if that's something to be expected. I don't really know. Uh, but anyway, it's time to straighten this thing out. And wrought iron is, it's a, it's a really neat material to work with. And of course, ages or generations ago, it was the primary material that a blacksmith would work with. Um, it, wrought iron was used for basically everything that mild steel is used for today. So structural use, um, you know, tools, what have you. It would even be used as blades um, with, you know, with a um, carburizing or a case hardening process, I should say, to give it the uh, qualities needed to actually make a cutting tool, at least on an outer layer of the of the of the iron. And of course, being wrought iron, it does not have carbon in it, so it's simply iron with a high silica content. So it's got a fibrous nature to it. That's also another interesting feature to wrought iron. So you know, it, it can kind of start to come apart on you as you squeeze it or hammer it which isn't too huge of a deal. You just work it at a higher temperature and at times reforge weld it back, to, back together um, on itself as it can kind of come apart on you. So the wrought iron anchor chain is part of the blade and the other part is going to be some pattern welded, what we call Damascus steel. It's a pattern welded steel 1095 and 15N20 that's gonna comprise about half of our blade and the edge on the on the edge side of the blade. So I have some pieces here that I forged um, some time ago and they're a little thinner. Um, they would make a decent little knife but I'm going to use them for this project so chop them up and restack them and uh, and we'll get some some uh, some different things going on with that. I actually created a ladder pattern on these particular pieces but we won't be using that in this case. So stacking that little billet up here, and I was about ready to tack weld it together, and I suddenly realized that I had the opportunity to add some additional uh, elements to it, which is some more 15 and 20. So we've got some, so we'll have some real bold lines uh, along the this section of the blade or this uh, part of the blade, and that's also going to add some additional overall strength to the blade and uh, it'll, it'll just and, and more mass so we'll have more material to work with. I didn't really cut them down to size, just kind of stuck them in there and we'll, we'll forge weld them together. These little diesel on there kind of aid in the forge welding process. That's our wrought iron that's uh, forged down to a three-quarter square bar now and it's been cooling so I'll finish cooling that off and I need to grind um, one side of it to forge weld to our, our Damascus bar. And I'm kind of looking here to see where the different uh, fibrous grains or even cracks um, run, kind of how they run. I want to forge weld it in a manner that it's going to provide the best uh, overall strength and the best look too. Um, so it, there's some different characteristics on this on this piece of wrought iron. So I've got this, uh, this billet here, get some flux on it and and we'll, we'll get this forge welded. Before I forget, I want to mention that I'm using uh, Empire Abrasives uh, belts, uh, ceramic belts for grinding. And I want to thank the guys at Empire Abrasives for sponsoring this video in part. 
But the more I use those belts, the more I like them. And they're, they're, they are top quality. They last a long time. I was actually using a, um, a used belt there that I had been grinding on some knives. And it still has plenty of life in it. It works great to continue cleaning up stuff like that. It's still cutting quite well. So just, uh, oh, and, and before I forget also, there's a link in the description here. If you click that link, you do help out the channel and get a little kickback. And you can also use the uh, promo code Fire Creek, all one word, no spaces, and that also helps the channel out here as well. So get this uh, billet forge welded together, and I ground off the the excess amount of our extra 15 and 20 because you try to forge that down on the side, you're going to end up with some cold shuts or um, different issues there. So you don't want that. So, I've got this forged down. I'm starting to forge it on a bias as well, which means basically perpendicular to the, the width of it. So we have a square bar. And the I'm going to forge weld this billet on the bias to the uh, rod iron as well, so that it's, it's atypical of what you would typically do, as you would normally do with a, a bar of, of uh, Damascus. So there they are, cooled down, cleaned up, ready to uh, attach to each other, and just uh, put a tack weld on there so they stay together. So welding wrought iron is pretty easy, actually. It you know iron takes a higher uh, welding temperature than steel does. The higher the carbon content, to a certain point, the uh, lower the welding temperature required. But since we're using high carbon steel in conjunction with this wrought iron, that kind of gives us that advantage there. And then another thing about wrought iron is the uh, natural silica content kind of actually acts as a, a natural flux in the iron. And so overall, it, it forge welds pretty easily. Um, and of course, having to press for that pressure helps, which is what I'm using here. But I got uh, dipped it in the diesel again, and uh, we'll get that heated up. So what the diesel does, if you're not familiar with that, is, you know, several things. First of all, if you're in a humid environment, that kind of thing, just the, uh, that'll protect it from moisture. But then once you put it into the forge, as it burns off, it's uh, uh, eating oxygen up that could cause oxidization. And it also leaves a small layer of carbon deposit, which can aid in the uh, forge loading process as well. But so we got the, the two bars heated up here and get some flux on there. And I kind of had to tap them together. There was a little gap there, so I kind of packed that, packed it together there, and then got some flux on there and back in to the forge once my flux is where it, where it needs to be there so it doesn't just fall off. And, of course, you want to do this with a, uh, a carburizing flame or at the very least a neutral flame in your forge, which means you don't have any excess oxygen coming into the uh, firebox or the forge because that will give you more problems with your steel and cause a, possibly cause a layer of uh, oxidization on the surfaces that you want to weld. So drawing this out here, and the, the wrought iron, of course, being more malleable than the steel at the same temperature, it's more malleable, period, but it, uh, it responds quicker to the pressure, so you kind of end up with like a banana shape uh, billet, billet there. And um, that was kind of a theme throughout this project. It got less pronounced as the uh, billet got thinner, but it's just something you're, you're working with here. So the idea behind this whole project is, is a couple of things. First of all, um, you know, Vikings being the, the uh, maritime culture that they were, you know, for some of their dastardly deeds and so forth, raiding whoever, you know, uh, but they, they, they had a maritime culture, and so the idea of an anchor chain, I think, is kind of neat to incorporate into this Viking sax. And then the, in, in the practical construction of this blade, the wrought iron it doesn't harden, of course, and it has a, a nice ductile strength to it. It's got some, some good uh, characteristics there, so that's going to give this blade uh, some great durability overall, which is a great thing to incorporate into a blade. And then finally, um, wrought iron with that uh, silica content, it, once you etch it, which is what we're going to do towards the end of this uh, blade building project, 
is um, it brings out that natural grain and it's a very, very neat, uh, neat look. So I'm excited about all those different aspects here. Get the tang forged out here. So what you saw me doing there a minute ago was cutting off the, what's going to be the tip end of the blade, the pointy end, uh, cutting that off. That isn't actually going to be the pointy end, but you'll see how that works here. What we want is um, we want our, our Damascus uh, section to curve up to the, to the point, and I'll get to that in a minute. But I'm forging the tang out here, and I had a little uh, spot where the uh, broad iron was kind of separating. I, I think it was separating from itself. Like I mentioned earlier, I, can't, I don't remember if it was that or if it was separating from the high carbon steel. But anyway, I got heated up to welding temperature, as you saw, and got some flux on it and just put it back together. Not a big deal. Um, and in wrought iron, it also seems to respond better to hammering than it does, at least in this case, with the hand hammering, I should say, than it did the press. Um, just, I don't know, I'm not sure why, but uh, if you just squish it down, you know, too much in one direction, it can, it can kind of start coming apart on you, whereas uh, the less lesser pressure of the hammer in a more consistent uh, um, fashion, I don't know, it just seemed to work better, but... Um, <laughs> I don't think there's been too many, uh, too many wrought iron, uh, things made back in the day with, uh, with a press. No, nope, probably not. So forging the tang down here and, uh, making that tapered, obviously we'll come back and finish that some more and prep it for putting the handle on, but, uh, getting it as close as possible in the forging process here is, is desirable. So obviously... That tang, just like the blade, it's uh, comprised of, you know, a, a, in half of it is uh, wrought iron and half of it's the or Damascus steel. So I think, you know, a lot of times you watch people forge stuff and, and they don't really pay as much attention to the tang in, in the video. And so that's why I'm kind of showing that a little more here. So dropping it off the envelope like this that's a necessary part of the operation um, it, it tells you where the balancing point is and so right here i'm knocking the corners off not only does this knock the corners off but it really actually helps to straighten the tang um, a lot easier once you get towards the final um, you know final stages of it it's a lot easier to straighten the tang on corner corner wise than it is um, flat or or on edge um, so that's kind of a helpful technique there and then of course you know not not wanting to have any sharp corners um, per se so drawing this down a little bit and now we're going to start forging in the tip so you can see what I'm doing here the uh, the angle that I cut right now I have the blade upside down and now it's right side up but I started forging it upside down and so the rod iron was on the bottom and what's what this is doing is um, bringing our our uh, Damascus steel, our edge portion, up around to the tip, so that we're not simply chopping that off and, and have a having a termination of uh, our two bars of steel. That doesn't, in my opinion, doesn't look right and uh, is not how it should be done. And so here we're actually forging the tip in. We're actually incorporating both of those bars of steel into a um, into the curve of the tip of the blade. So. Work that down a little bit here, and then I'm gonna start uh, forging in the bevel here in just a minute. So talk about saxes a little bit. So what is a sax? Well, typically um, it's a larger knife from you know the Viking culture, but the, the, the word sax actually means knife, and there is quite a range of um, saxes, uh, historically and archeologically speaking. Um, one of the more commonly Recognized designs would be a broken back sax, or you have a, a more of a defined, uh, almost what you might recognize as a clip point, not too dissimilar to um, Bowie knives, uh, ironically enough. But I'm not making one of those. I'm making a, a more uh, generic, if you will, or traditional sax. So it's a longer uh, blade with a more gradual point to it. Anyway, there's, there's a number of different uh, design characteristics, but uh, again, historically and archaeologically speaking, all of the ones that I'm aware of have a tapered or hidden tang, and none of them have a full tang. 
I think one of the reasons for that probably was the scarcity of material. I mean, when, when you're making a blade from a valuable uh, material such as the steel or the wrought iron that they were um, forge welding together or what have you, uh, whatever the materials, it was much more difficult to obtain, much more expensive to get. And so you'd, you wouldn't want to waste uh, material on, on making a big clunky handle when you didn't need to. You know, so you, you would sacrifice, you know, three or four inches of, of uh, blade length if you did that with your handle, whereas you could forge out a tang and have a bigger, longer, better blade and that would perform just as well. So I think that was probably one of the reasons. And then maybe the, the method of handle construction was another big thing. Typically the saxes were uh, handled in, uh, or half to or whatever you want to call it, in bone or wood. And um, so it, those two reasons make a lot of sense to me as a bladesmith as to why they were, they're all hidden tangs or tapered tangs. So I did a, a, a quick forge normalizing cycle there, and the blade's still pretty hot right here at this point. But the wrought iron was kind of giving me a little bit of trouble um, as, as the blade cooled down. I was able to finally get uh, our Damascus steel or powder welded steel in this wrought iron to kind of cooperate and end up with a nice, pretty nice straight blade. So took a little of, took a little fiddling and fussing with it, knocking stuff around a little bit, but everything held together just fine and was able to, like I say, able to get it uh, nice and straight, everything within, you know, the margin of error when it comes to grinding the blade. So that was that was good. So here we are going into a normalizing cycle as always and um, still again I'm kind of uh, keeping an eye on what it's going to do here as I heat this thing up and let it cool and all this kind of stuff because I'm sure there's a little different uh, thermal coefficients and that kind of stuff with this wrought iron. So my, my little wife brought me home a chicken pot pie so I took a break here to enjoy that um, kind of I, I'm kind of fond of chicken pot pies, if I do say so myself. And uh, and I should also mention, too, my cool rise and grind shirt from Empire Braces. I picked that one because, obviously, the, the coffee connection. You know, what else? Um, they, I was going to mention earlier, uh, Empire Braces has a huge selection of uh, various grinding, buffing, uh, sanding, all this kind of stuff. Uh, grinding wheels, what have you. So, um if you're in the market for abrasives, a <clears throat> good place to check out. All right, guys, so into the quench we go. And again, I was a little uh, apprehensive. What is this going to do here? And what, 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 what are we going to end up with? Well, um, making sure that the residual heat is dissipated enough so that I don't uh, over temper anything on accident, over auto temper. You can see the scale popping off of there as the uh, mainly the iron, the wrought iron, contracts and um, displaces that scale. It's pretty cool. It's always slightly disconcerting when you hear pings and pops. Not the kind of ting that a blade crack, nothing like that, but those little pieces of scale popping off and it's kind of interesting. But basically, we ended up with a, a rather bowed blade. But, um, you know, not quenching it down to room temperature or oil temperature. Still enough heat in there to where our blade is uh, slowly coming down in temperature. And we're still um, out of the quench. We're still at austenite. It has not converted to martensite yet. That coupled with the fact that we have a wrought iron spine on this blade gives us plenty of uh, maneuverability to get that thing straight. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing here. And applying pressure and moving that around as it cools down and kind of guiding that that thing in there so i was able to get our blade back to nice and straight um, the one thing i did kind of notice coming out of the quench is it sort of uh, curves slightly um, towards the edge um, as, as in our edge steel kind of contracted more but that more or less corrected itself as the blade cooled and then after the temper and it's hardly noticeable and it's definitely nothing to worry about. So there's our forged blade guys. You can see some of our uh, 15 and 20 uh, sawmill blade steel lines in there. And then up, uh, up to the top here on the left, that's all wrought iron and that's gonna have a really cool grain to go with our pattern welded. It's gonna have a, I'm, I'm really excited to see what it looks like. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, you can just see some 
some shadows, some ideas there of what it's going to look like. So it'll be very exciting. Anyway, guys, that's it for today. I appreciate you watching as always. We'll see you on the next video.